This episode is brought to you by Squarespace, where website design is made easy. What is going on, my fellow mythology nerds? My name is John Solo, and this is Mythology Explained. On this week's episode, I'm breaking down why women are the source of all of the world's problems. Pretty bold way of starting a video during Women's History Month, huh? Now, don't misunderstand me, keyboard warriors. I am not saying that's my opinion, but it is the theme of the world-famous myth, Pandora's Box, which is today's topic of discussion. I'm assuming that if you're watching this, you at least know the basics of the story. A girl called Pandora is given a box by Zeus and is told not to open it, but curiosity gets the best of her, so she does, and as a result, releases the evils and plagues that still haunt our civilization to this day. In other words, she done fucked up. Now, when these are the only details that you know, it's easy to get mad at Pandora for bringing about the end of the Golden Age and ruining the paradise that mankind had before she came along. But like all Greek myths, the story is much more complicated than that. The truth is, Pandora was simply a pawn in a complex chess game between titans and gods. I know you're excited to learn what I mean by that, and I'm excited to share it with you, so I say we just jump into it. As always, I would appreciate you dropping a like before we get started, and if content like this on a weekly basis sounds appealing to you, then hit subscribe as well. And now, ladies and gents, the messed up myth of Pandora's box. So the first fact about Pandora's myth that surprised me was that it was more than just a curiosity kills the cat fable. It's actually more of a creation myth that spans the entire first age of mankind, also known as the Golden Age. According to the poet Hesiod, Zeus's father Cronus ruled the universe for the majority of this time period, and Zeus and the Olympians took over towards the end after the war against the Titans. When that transition happened, the new gods said they wanted to be compensated for overseeing basically everything that went down on Earth, so they ordered the Titan Prometheus, which is believed to have meant forethought, to create mankind out of clay. They also assigned his brother Epimetheus, which means afterthought, the task of creating the animals that mankind would use as resources and as a means of sacrifice. And he did a great job for the most part. He gave some animals the gift of strength, others swiftness, some were given defenses like horns and venom or the ability to burrow underground. There were some that he left defenseless, but they were destined to be prey animals that sustain the predators and would have many offspring to prevent them from dying out completely. So the animal kingdom was all balanced out. However, staying true to his name, Epimetheus didn't think far enough ahead and made the mistake of using all of the resources the gods gave them to arm the animals, leaving Prometheus nothing to give humankind. We had weak arms, weak legs, and at that point, very simple minds. We were not the masterpiece that Zeus had intended us to be. With the dawn of mankind approaching, Prometheus had no choice but to find a way to give us an advantage against the elements, so he stole fire from the blacksmith god Hephaestus and a fennel stalk and smuggled it down to earth along with some of his knowledge about the mechanical art. Now, you might be wondering why Prometheus had to smuggle those gifts to mankind in secret, and that has an interesting answer. You see, when the Titan was first assigned the task of creating the human race, he knew the gods were going to take advantage of them, and he didn't want that happening to his little babies. As a result, he tricked Zeus into accepting worse sacrifices from them. The way he did this was he convinced the god of thunder to allow humans to only sacrifice half of each animal they killed instead of the entire thing. You know, so they had something to live on. Zeus agreed to that, but then Prometheus pulled a fast one. He sacrificed two bowls, put all of their delicious meats into one bundle, and then their bones, waste, and other yucky stuff into the other, and covered them both in hide. He then told Zeus to choose which bundle he wanted, and Zeus, who didn't realize they were any different, picked the gross one, meaning that mankind could keep all of the good parts of the animal for themselves. In addition to explaining why Zeus was angry at Prometheus, this also shed some light on the custom of the ancient Greeks, where they burned away the rest of the animal after the flesh had been consumed. Anyway, being that he was a sore loser about being tricked, and that mankind had just been given an unintentional advantage, he sought to make sure that never happened again and gave the essence of fire to Hephaestus for safekeeping, since his foundry is one of the only places that it was used on Olympus. As a result, Prometheus had no choice but to steal it from mankind. And by the way, this is also where we get the tradition of carrying the torch at the Olympics, which is another Greek invention. The ceremony is supposed to resemble the Titan giving us fire. The more you know. Sadly, neither Prometheus nor mankind got away with this one scot-free. For Prometheus's punishment, he was captured and bound to a stake on Mount Caucasus, which, fun fact, was in a region of the same name and is where the term Caucasian stems from. The Titan was sentenced to an eternity of having an eagle, a sacred symbol of Zeus, feed on his liver throughout the entire day and having it regenerate every night. It sounds fucking terrible, there's no doubt about that, but mankind's punishment may have been even worse, and that's what we're talking about next. 
So while Prometheus was busy having his liver eaten over and over again, Zeus came up with the perfect plan to bring about the end of paradise for mankind, and that plan was to create the first woman. This is where the story starts to get a bit misogynistic, so I do want to remind you that while I can be a sarcastic ass at times, these are not my opinions or interpretations of the myth. It's literally what Hesiod wrote. Now, under Zeus's orders, Hephaestus made the first woman out of earth and water. He gave her the voice and strength of humankind and the feminine face and shape of the goddesses. Athena taught the new female needlework, Aphrodite poured grace upon her head and made it so that men would all desire her, and Hermes gave her a shameless mind and deceitful nature. She was then given the name Pandora, which most experts believe means all gifts or all giving, because all of the Olympians provided a gift that would plague men and put it in a jar that she would bring to earth. Note that I just said jar and not box, because contrary to popular belief, in the original myth, Pandora was given a jar or pithos. As is often the case with old stories, the mix-up is the result of a mistranslation by a guy known as Erasmus of Rotterdam, who translated the story and turned the Greek word for jar into the Latin word for box and was never corrected. It's so crazy to me how little mistakes like that can have such a massive influence over the rhetoric our society uses. I don't think I've ever heard someone say the phrase open Pandora's jar, but I've heard the phrase Pandora's box box used twice in just the last week, and it's not even right. Another interesting bit is that this jar full of evils and plagues isn't the only one that Zeus had. According to Homer's Iliad, the god of thunder had two jars that sat in front of his door sill. The second one was filled with blessings instead of sorrows, and apparently Zeus would selectively sprinkle them on society when he thought we deserved it. There's also some versions of the myth that say the jar of blessings is really the one Pandora was given, but more on that later. After Pandora was created, Hermes delivered her to Epimetheus, who fell in love as soon as he saw her, and married her pretty much immediately. This is despite Prometheus warning him to never accept a gift from Zeus, by the way, but once again, he just wasn't thinking of the repercussions. Now, just a reminder, at this point, men were still living in total peace, free from ills, hard labor, and disease, basically meaning they were immortal, because according to Ovid, those are what bring the fates upon men for in misery, men grow old quickly. But this paradise wasn't going to last forever because that jar of sorrows the gods made was about to be opened, and there's a few versions of how that goes down. In one of them, Pandora is sent to Epimetheus, jar in hand, and under Zeus's orders, she opens it immediately after they get married. But there's many others that present it as a far less malicious act. In the one that people are most familiar with, Zeus gives the jar to Pandora as a wedding present, then tells her not to open it without saying why. But curiosity gets the better of her, and she ends up releasing all of the evils of imaginable on the world. And yet another, it's not even her that opens it, but her new husband, Epimetheus. The one detail that each of these versions have in common is that after those evils had been set free, one last thing remained in the jar, and that's hope. And according to Aesop, that is why hope alone, not to be confused with Post Malone, is still found among the people, promising that she will bestow on each of us the good things that have gone away. In other words, because hope stayed behind, we humans will always have it. No matter how dire and painful our situation is, there was always the possibility that it gets better. And mankind really needed that hope because life in the Silver Age would never be the same. Countless plagues can now be found throughout mankind, and according to Hesiod, it's all women's fault. Not just because Pandora opened the jar, but because with the introduction of women, men now had something they desired more than anything, and as a result, something to compete and stress over. Now, this is where it gets kind of awkward, because Hesiod frames the entire female gender as these evil creatures meant to destroy the lives of men through their relationships with them. And while I definitely disagree with him, I do understand the point he's making. Because in this context, before there were women, men had really nothing to do besides gather resources and sacrifice to the gods. Life was very simple. There wasn't this hunger for power that you see in people nowadays because back then there were no mates to compete for and ipso facto, nothing to do with that power. It wasn't until the essence of competition was introduced with the beautiful, perfect, amazing creation known as women that men began to lie, manipulate, and intentionally hurt others because they all wanted to climb to the top of the hierarchy and have access to any mate they wanted. On top of all that, being in a romantic relationship means making yourself vulnerable. And because women were also human and had a very similar nature as men, they would sometimes hurt the ones they committed to, and that was the worst pain of all. He see it's just describing this phenomenon as if it's a one-way street, which it's not. And no point does he say that men can do no wrong, but he does neglect to say otherwise. Honestly, it sounds like he wrote this myth immediately after being broken up with. He also points out the issue of trying to outsmart Zeus and abstain from marrying a woman. If you stay single, you'll grow old with no one to take care of you. And while you may be wealthier when you die, your riches will go to your friends and neighbors instead of your family because you don't have one. He says there's a small 
chance of marrying a truly good woman, but even then she could deliver mischievous children, which will be a constant source of grief, shame, and anxiety for as long as you live. So in true Zeus fashion, he delivered the perfect punishment. He created the object of ultimate desire, made men want it more than anything in the world, and then gave it the ability to cause pain like no other. Pain that destroys you slowly from the inside. Anyway, on a lighter note, there's a little more to Pandora's story. After the whole jar full of evils debacle, her and Epimetheus went on to have a daughter and name her Pyra, which means fire. I'm assuming that Zeus was not a fan of that name. Now, if you're familiar with the Bible, and more specifically, the story of Adam and Eve, you probably noticed a few similarities with Eve and Pandora. Namely, that each is the first woman in the world, they both disobey divine law, and as a result, cause the transition from everyone living on Easy Street to attending the school of hard knocks. Now, I am nowhere near a religious scholar, so unfortunately, I can't really speak much on the connection between the two stories, but some experts have argued that the spreading of Greek culture may have had some influence on the Christian and Jewish interpretations of scripture. In other words, the the misogyny that we see in Hesiod's story may have played a role in the book of Genesis portraying Eve as the destroyer of paradise. And the crazy thing about that is just because Hesiod's version is the one that withstood the test of time, that doesn't mean it was how the majority of ancient Greece thought of the story. In fact, some experts believe that there was another version before Hesiod's where Pandora was actually a generous earth deity. And over time, her role was changed so that instead of giving blessings to humans, possibly from that other jar I mentioned earlier, she gave them sorrows. It's just wild to see how these things change over time in the scope of their influence. And one last thing, this isn't totally relevant, but there's one other weird connection that Greek mythology has with the Bible. Hesiod also wrote that Pandora's daughter went on to marry Prometheus's son, Deucalion, and together they built an ark to survive the great flood that Zeus intended to restart humanity. I'll probably do a video on that full myth some other time, but it's clearly connected to Noah's Ark somehow, and I'm curious to see what I can dig up on it. But on that note, Solo fam, it's time to bring this episode to a close. That was the Pandora myth from beginning to end, and I'm curious to hear what you think. What are your thoughts on the story and how Hesiod portrayed women? Do you agree with my analysis of his portrayal or do you think I'm just making excuses for a guy who was upset that he couldn't get a date? Let me know in the comments down below. And while you're doing that, let me tell you about this week's sponsor, Squarespace. One of my favorite things about Greek mythology is reading about the incredible ways that heroes, gods, and titans alike find solutions to their problems. During his fifth labor, Heracles reroutes an entire river to clean poo out of the Augean stables. Prometheus steals fire from the gods to arm mankind. It always amazes amazes me how clever they are. And do you know what else amazes me? How the folks at Squarespace did the same thing with web design. They knew that now more than ever, people needed to be able to build their own websites, whether it's to market their business, share their thoughts on a blog, or show off their artwork. As a result, people like you and me, aka people who don't know jack about programming, can set up new homes for ourselves online without downloading or installing anything. Squarespace offers a massive selection of award-winning templates to help you get started. Their layouts are completely customizable. They have built-in players for both video and audio making showing off your work incredibly easy? They pretty much thought of everything, and that includes automatically generating mobile versions of any site you build with them. That's exactly why I use them to set up MessedUpOrigins.com and will continue to use them for any websites I need in the future. If you want to follow in my footsteps and start building the online home that you not only want, but also need and deserve, just go to Squarespace.com to start your free trial. And when you're ready to launch, head to Squarespace.com slash John Solo to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. Another great ad read. I've just been killing it lately. Anyway, it's time for me to let you go. As always, make sure you hit that like button if you enjoyed this video and subscribe to receive more content just like it on a weekly basis. Links to my social media are down below. Feel free to give those a follow if you want to stay updated on channel news, what content is coming up next, or if you just want to say hello. And of course, follow my pal Gunther because he wants to bless your timeline with this smushy face of his. Thank you all for watching, Solo fam. I'll be seeing you very soon. Until next time, my name is John Solo, and remember, John shot first.